Good evening, welcome. Please take your seats. We're about to get started. Thank you for coming. My name is Sebastian Burke. I'm the Director of Corporate Programs at the Council. And we're delighted to welcome Mr. Mike Kazenko to our platform tonight. His latest book, um, Red Teams, How to Succeed by Thinking Like the Enemy, will be available for signing and purchasing um, at the end of the event in the back of the room. I would also like to thank our partners, the Council on Foreign Relations, for their collaboration on this event. And a few housekeeping items before we begin. Please note that this event is on the record and we are live streaming as well. So feel free to use social media, but please silence your phones. We have a lot of um, exciting upcoming programs at the Council, but I'd like to highlight just a few of them. On June 13th, author Michelle Wilker will speak on the obvious threats we ignore. On June 14th, Peter Doran from the Center for European Policy Analysis in DC will detail the past, present, and future of oil and oil markets. And on June 28, we will be hosting Gover Governor Jerome Powell um, of the Federal Reserve Board, who will speak on the economic outlook for the US and beyond. That should be a very interesting program, especially on the heels of the June Fed meeting. We have, as I mentioned, a few more programs online, so please check our website. I will return to moderate the Q&A, but before that, I'd like to welcome to the stage to introduce our speaker, Mr. Greg Goldner. He's the founder and CEO of Resolute Consulting and a valued member of our director's circle at the council. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Greg Goldner. Good evening. Um, thank you all for coming this evening. Uh, on behalf of the Chicago Council, I'd like to thank uh, you for being here. And also, if you did not participate uh, last week, the Chicago Council hosted its second annual um, forum on global cities. Uh, it was a great program, so thank you to Evo and all the team for all the work that they did in pulling that off and look forward to that to uh, being a Chicago institution. Um, tonight, we're very uh, delighted to welcome Micah Zanko to discuss his book uh, on red teaming. As you may know, red teaming has become an increasingly crucial strategy for corporations, military and security agencies, police departments, and others as they look at future threats and how to manage risk. Red teams, which consist of modern day double advocates, uh, probe internal systems and operations and confront predetermined strategies and convictions to identify institutional strengths and weaknesses. Um, how organizations utilize red teams most efficiently, what is the best way to use information they yield, who's best suited to serve on a red team, are all covered in the book, and we look forward to Mr. Zanko's insightful perspectives on this interesting and relevant topic. Before we begin, uh, allow me to introduce our speaker. He is currently a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and previously he's worked at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government, uh, the Brookings Institution, the Congressional Research Service, and the State Department's Office of Policy Planning. He's author of numerous books and a few more to come in the future that we know of. Uh, on security-related topics, and his articles appeared in Foreign Affairs, The Washington Post, The Los Angeles Times, and Chicago Tribune. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Micah Zenko. Hello. Thank you so much for coming out uh, this evening. It's, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, learn from everybody and to share some of my insights especially happy to be here at the Chicago Council. Evo Dalder, who uh, runs this outfit, was the first person to ever pay me for researching and writing. I was a young uh, intern at the Brookings Institution, and at the time, Evo was a senior fellow there as well as had an affiliation at the University of Maryland, and I was working on a project for him related to the National Security Council. And, he, and we were doing work, and at some point he said, you know, I think we can pay you. And I had to go out to College Park, Maryland and sign some papers, but I, I did get paid and I've always been grateful for that. And he was a great mentor and a scholar and a practitioner, both um, in Washington and then in Brussels. And you're very, you're very, very lucky to have him uh, here in Chicago. So um, uh, take advantage of, uh, of, his, of his connections and his brain power um, while, while he's here, because it's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about why I wrote this book, Red Teams, and then sort of dive into uh, the subject matter a little bit. I wrote a book about red teams because to my surprise, nobody had done that. 
um, which seems like an obvious thing for an author picking a book topic, but it's often the case that you believe that these concepts like of red teams are in the news a lot, so somebody must have written a book. But you look around and in fact, there was no book written. And I knew people who served on red teams, both in the military and the intelligence community, and I asked them, are there, are there anything on the inside that we can get our hands on? And they said no. And I said, um, well, you know, why, why isn't that? And in, and in the private sector as well, this is done. And the reason there was no book written about it is because most of what red teams do is classified. It is uh, hidden uh, for, for government secrecy reasons or from the private sector. People in the private sector sign non-disclosure agreements um, or, uh, as you may know, um, people in the private sector are often uh, less than reliable about the uh, efficacy of their strategies, plans, and policies because they want to project an image that is, um, uh, I would say, useful for their, for their shareholders or their investors. And so it's often hard to believe uh, what private sector people tell you. Um, so I tackled this project over the course of about six years. Um, I had been collecting information on red teams for a long time, but I just realized that this is a uh, sort of un- uh, un understood topic and you re really need to talk to the people who are doing it. So what I did is I went around and I spoke to people who red team for a living. I did over 200 interviews. I went to, uh, I talked to a lot of hackers. Uh, I went to the security conferences. I went out to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, where they teach the people in the army how to red team. I went there seven times. Uh, I took their two week red team course. Um, I also became a certified business war gamer. Uh, which you can do with two days of uh, coursework uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, if you're interested. Um, and I spent a lot of time in Washington and in military commands and just learned to people who did this. So, you know, the, 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 the biggest thing I learned is why do you need to red team? And as I always tell people, it, um, if you work at, a, at any organization, any uh, business, you don't show up in the morning and decide that morning what to do. Right. There are a series of standard operating procedures, a, stand, a series of expected behaviors, of values, of mores. There are expected dress. There's expected ways that you participate in groups. You're expected to uh, fill in time forms and explain your day-to-day uh, -day tasks. Um, over time, those expected behaviors uh, shape and constrain the way you think. It, it's true everywhere you work. Uh, you cannot escape this. Uh, it is a fact. It's documented in lots of, with, by lots of social scientists. Um, and once you recognize that you can't, um, uh, uh, that you're shaped by your own institution, uh, uh, the problem is that institutions are the least likely, the people working in institutions are the least likely to identify blind spots in their plans. They're the least likely to uncover vulnerabilities, and they're the least likely to assume adversarial perspective. So if you work somewhere, you may know something's wrong with what's going on. You are probably not going to tell your boss. And the reason you're not going to voice up as they use it in the business world is because you think it's useless or you're going to be retaliated against. Um, if you, you're also, uh, because you're so immersed in the problem sets that you work on, you cannot sort of, as they say, see the forest for the trees. Um, you and the people you work with uh, experience groupthink. Over time, no matter how diverse the composition of a team is, and this is also measured in lots of, no matter demographically, educational, uh, experiential, over time, people who work together day after day after day tend to think alike. It's not by chance, it's because it's easier to get things done and to get along. Um, the other sort of institutional pathology that makes this a problem is in the military what they call command climate, which is what the boss, what the senior commander decides has a huge impact on how everybody behaves. Um, and many commanders, I always tell people, and if you ever read the New York Times um, business section, they have something called the Corner Office Series. And this is where they interview senior leaders, uh, NGO world, private sector, military, and every senior leader says the same three, three things, which is, one, my door is always open. Anybody can come in anytime. The second is, we have a very horizontal organization, which is, uh, uh, we let people, we want people to share what they know with everybody else. And then the third thing they say, is if there's a problem in my organization, I'll know about it because my door's open and I welcome challenging and dissenting viewpoints. And it's amazing that every leader says this. And then we have lots of surveys with people who are employees and they never say this. Uh, I always find it funny to do a leadership profile and not speak to the lead. You know, 
uh, and not allow the lead to speak anonymously to the reporter, it's almost useless. It's like I work at a polite centrist think tank in New York City. If you asked me the value of my think tank, you should not believe what I tell you, right? Because I have every incentive to be misleading and to inflate its utility and to brag about what we do. But when it comes to leadership profiles, they allow this sort of all the time. Um, so anyways, once you recognize that the organization is the least likely to see the internal problems with themselves, they're the least likely to find blind spots and to think about how their enemies and adversaries see them, red teaming is a potentially effective management tool to overcome these institutional pathologies and cognitive biases. Um, so the, again, the, the, the theme of my book, which is sort of, you, you see it throughout, is, is you cannot grade your own homework, right? You cannot, I cannot, nobody can. Um, and worst of all is that there's a, something called the Dunning-Kruger effect. David Dunning, he's a great uh, um, uh, psychologist at Cornell. I, I invite everyone to read his stuff. He sort of documents that people who think, they, they give, they give uh, students, they give uh, professionals pop quizzes, and the people who think they did the best in the pop quiz actually do the worst. So the, what, there's the widest variance between their actual proficiency and how well they think they did. Um, the problem is that uh, the more people get older and leaders assume higher levels of positions, they assume that the way that they processed information and made decisions throughout their rise through the ranks must have worked or else they wouldn't have made it that far. And we know that the more and more senior people become, the more overconfident they become and the less likely they're to see things differently. And this is actually measured the... Um, the U.S. Army War College, for example, every year they give a study to every incoming one-star general. So when you become general officer, you take this survey. It's called the Openness to New Ideas Survey. And they've been doing this. They give this to the American public, and they give this to one-star uh, one generals. And they have learned that every new one-star general in the U.S. Army is the least open to new ideas compared to the general American public. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because the goal of a general is to get the job done, to follow doctrine, to establish principles and command climate. Um, so they're gonna be the least likely, again, to uh, see dissenting viewpoints, to welcome them, um, and to see things a different way. Um, sort of another problem of this is what's called going native or clientism, which is to say that if you work in any organization, over time you sense the incentives and you sense what people want to hear, right? And if the incentive structure is such that you need to keep your head down and go along to get along, you're gonna uh, absorb that and behave accordingly. Um, we care tremendously, um, and psychology tells us this, about impression making. Impression making, especially among senior leadership, is, a, is something that uh, uh, shapes us every single day. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, we all like to believe that we're unique snowflakes who can think outside of the box. And really bad news for you, you probably aren't. Um, because the truth of the matter is, uh, most of people who think they're mavericks, you know, as, I, as, I, as, as somebody who worked in a, uh, in a Fortune 500 company told me, he goes, you know, every maverick gets hunted down and killed eventually because that person has uh, harmed somebody else in the institution by definition with their, with their viewpoint and their perspective. Uh, at, uh, Mavericks either get hunted down and killed or they get diminished and put into a, a separate program or a quiet room so they can't um, sort of upset the apple cart. Um, you know, so once you recognize this, again, red teams are, are, are a way to do this. Uh, challenge assumptions, they identify blind spots, they do things that other people can't do. And I'll just give you sort of one, one example uh, where red teaming would have been really, really effective but it was not used. Um, you may recall in uh, 1980, in April 1980, Jimmy Carter uh, authorized what is still considered the riskiest military operation in U.S. military history. Uh, he basically sent over 140 Navy SEALs and Army Delta folks into Iran uh, on six different helicopters that were going to be met up with uh, 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 in-air refueling uh, planes that landed in the Iranian desert, and then they were going to uh, do an airborne assault of uh, where it was believed U.S. hostages were being held in Tehran. To this day, I mean, at the time, the, the, the senior leader commander said, if this all goes well, it has about a 10% chance of success. And one of the problems was that uh, the people who wrote the plan, because secrecy was of such importance, they were locked in a room. It's called a SCIF, a, a secure compartmentalized facility in the Pentagon. They were locked in this SCIF for six months. They worked 12 hours a day, and they wrote the plan, the campaign plan for how to get this done. 
At no point was that plan presented to any independent outside set of eyes. Um, and the one thing we know in every uh, organization, every field, people who write the plan fall in love with the plan. This is true in the private sector especially. Uh, this is a big problem why red teaming is big in VC and M&A issues is that if you're working really hard on a merger, some merger and acquisition issue, you have worked on that every single hour of your life for months and months and months and months and you diminish every excuse for why the plan, why it shouldn't happen. Um, and after the fact, they, they commissioned a panel and, they, uh, and they, they, they tried to see what happened and the after action report of the failed hostage rescue attempt when 13, uh, uh, it was 13 Army Delta guys lost their lives in the deserts of Iran. It said, planners in effect reviewed and critiqued their own product for feasibility and soundness. Uh, the hostage rescue plan was never subjected to rigorous testing and evaluation by uh, a staff themselves. There is little doubt regarding its potential value, a comprehensive and continuing review capability impacts directly on all issues. And it could have played an important part in the dynamic planning process that evolved. And largely as a result of that, people who write campaign plans in the military now recognize that you need an independent set of eyes um, who is not absorbed in the day-to-day -day tasks of writing out what is campaign plans are extremely detailed, they have lots of different annexes, and we now have people who do this um, as a result of it. So when I talk about red teams, what do I mean specifically? What are three types of red teams? Uh, and, and when I wrote the book, you have to come up with a definition, you have to come up with a typology because there was none. And so my typology of red teams is the first type is what's called simulations. So a simulation is before a likely or scheduled or potential event, you basically run through it every way you can to see how it will fail. Um, another term for this is what's known as pre-mortem analysis. Like let's think about every point of failure before failure happens. Mm -hmm. and the, one of the better examples I document in the book was I was very lucky to get um, unique access to the NYPD uh, commissioner um, under Ray Kelly and under uh, Chief Bratton. I, I, I was able to attend a series of what are called um, commissioner's tabletop exercises. So these take place on the 16th floor of one police plaza. Basically every, singer, every senior NYPD commander, uh, every senior New York government or New York City official, including the two I went to, uh, Mayor de Blasio attended, uh, most of them, um, they go through what could happen, everything that could go wrong for an upcoming event. So they did this when the Pope showed up, and uh, one of the things they did was, so what happens if there's really horrible rain, and, uh, and if there's a, a hurricane offshore, and you don't get access to airborne um, um, capabilities or boats? <clears throat> and this, uh, by the way, happens at the same time with the UN General Assembly. And, and say you lose access to communication, um, and you don't have walkie-talkies anymore. Like, what do you do? Uh, and it turns out basically what they do is they fly all the planes far inland into New Jersey, they take all the boats far up the Hudson River so they can't be destroyed, but you lose this capability that you thought you had. So how do you adjust on the fly? And it basically, and the other great one I, which I attended two of them was what happens if there's a terrorist attack on the New York City Marathon? Uh, and they run a series of scenarios and simulations which is basically somebody sitting in front of a podium like this um, ha and, they, and they keep uh, uh, running uh, pictures and charts so it makes it very vivid and real, is say above the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, a series of drones appear. Who's responsible for that and what do you do? And there's silence because somebody is responsible for that and they have to make a decision then and there about what they will really do at the time. And they can't cheat. They can't say like, well, I would send this, this, and this capability if they don't actually have it. Because the, the people running it is, um, his name's Jim Waters. He's the chief of counterterrorism bureau. He knows what everybody has at that time. So nobody can lie and cheat. And then what happens, for example, uh, basically the 16 mile mark of the marathon, you come into the, uh, uh, back into Manhattan and you turn right on First Avenue and you start heading up to Harlem. And what happens at the 16 mile mark if a big cluster of runners uh, starts collapsing and throwing up? Did they drink tainted water or does it just look like cluster because it turns out a lot of people really get exhausted at the 16 mile mark because they realize I'm back in Manhattan. Um, uh, what do you do? Who's responsible for this? And the, it was really interesting because who attended both times was the New York Roadrunners. And the New York Roadrunners, who actually run the marathon, revealed things about how they prepared that the police didn't know about. Like it's really, really hard to uh, taint the water because they have plans for that and then backup plans for that. They can stop the race course at any point. They can divert the race course at any point uh, if there's an explosive or a suspicious package. They can set up multiple 
uh, independent uh, finish lines around Central Park if there's a threat to Central Park. And it was fascinating because I was sitting next to this two-star. A two-star commander is the, there's like a two-star for Brooklyn North, a two-star for Brooklyn South, one for Staten Island, and some of them had never heard this before. And so in the absence of doing this sort of simulation, they wouldn't have been as well prepared for a potential terrorist attack. So that's, that's one type of red teaming simulation. The second type is what's called the vulnerability probe. The vulnerability probes are probably the ones people know the best because it's basically trying to break into an allegedly secure facility. And um, this is basically everybody thinks that their building is relatively safe. Um, but I can tell you, or their computer networks or their software, their phone is relatively safe. It, it definitely isn't, um, but that's fine uh, as long as you recognize the risks to the data you have and the information you're trying to protect and you take the best practice common sense uh, behaviors to mitigate the threats that are posed to that data and information. Um, I spent time with the people who break into buildings for a living, for example. Uh, they, they never fail. It's quite remarkable. Uh, you may think, you know, the most secure buildings, nobody can get in here. And they will social engineer their way into any building. And I have a story in the book, and I don't say where this happened, where I accidentally broke into a highly secure government building. And the way I did this was I was scheduled to meet with a very senior official in this building. I showed up because uh, uh, there was traffic getting there. I showed up like five minutes late. I come up to the long line waiting to get screened and everything, and someone starts yelling, Zinko, Zinko, and I'm like, yeah, that's me, and they go, come on, they're waiting. So I go around the uh, screening area. I then go up to where you're supposed to register and show ID and get some slip of paper, uh, and they, and, but an intern who came down, grabbed me before then, and said, are you Zinko? I said, yeah. And then the guy who was supposed to be checking my ID and give me paper hands me a piece of paper that says screened on it which I'm just supposed to hold on to. And then I walk with this intern to the elevator. We go up to the uh, floor and I'm sitting across, this, sitting across from this government official. I had never been, no one knew who I was. No one had ever screened me for weapons or explosives. I could have done tremendous damage. I could have claimed I worked at CFR by having a fake email address. And I could have known what Micah Zinko looks like and showed up and done this quite easily. And this is what people who break into buildings do. And they do it all the time. Um, and I document a couple of the most novel and fun stories um, <clears throat> in the book. And if you, if you read the stories, they're just the tip of the iceberg of what these people do. And you can also just go on YouTube and watch some of their presentations uh, because they wear often GoPro cameras while they break into your building, which is streamed in real time to the CEO's desktop. So <laughs> the CEO watches uh, how insecure their building is. Now, the point isn't to embarrass and humiliate the, uh, uh, the security team, because the, uh, a good hacker can break into anything. Uh, they can embarrass or humiliate anybody. They just go for the weakest point. And by the way, um, a lot of these guys, and they're almost all guys, like when they get caught by the security guards, they will hand a card which says, I'm here to do a security evaluation. Look, I've seen some of your bad security here. If you let me go, I won't tell the chief security officer of the problem here. <laughs> And of course, then they report the fact that they let them go. Um, so again, they never fail to get in. Similar in the cyber world, uh, um, the, the ability to get access to any encrypted, protected system is uh, total. Uh, and it's not, it, it doesn't take a great deal of proficiency anywhere because uh, you can basically buy malware or find malware uh, uh, and just and, and implant it fairly easily into a lot of different systems. Uh, and in fact, one of the big complaints of most of the hackers I know is that they don't even get to use their best stuff because breaking into things is actually so easy that they write code to have really boutique pieces of malware and they never get to use it. Um, but if you're interested in learning more about it, uh, you know, just Google DEF CON Black Hat. You can, you can watch the presentations they're, they're on YouTube. And again, they break into every single thing. The most uh, troubling story I, I uncovered in my book is <clears throat> In a building like this, you probably have what's called femtocells. cells. So a femtocell cell is a small repeating uh, cell phone tower. It acts as a cell phone tower for uh, tall buildings, dense city skyscrapers, and it just basically repeats cell phone signals. So you get signal in a building. And um, these guys who are hackers, they basically figured out how to get root access to the cell phone tower to get this to a femto cell. And as a result of doing that, every phone, whether it's on or not, associates with that cell phone, mini cell phone tower. And they could not just get access to your phone, they could clone your phone and then send text messages, emails, video from what looked like your phone to anybody. Um, and it was Verizon Femtocell, and they found this and they 
They told Verizon, Verizon sends out the patch, and then they brag about it, basically. It's called responsible disclosure. And then I was at DEF CON last year in Las Vegas, and these Chinese guys found the same vulnerability in a slightly different femtoad cell. So you thought, like, people would be aware of this vulnerability. It turns out it was, it's like in every piece of software. So that's the second type of red teaming. The third type uh, is what's called alternative analysis. So alternative analysis is the recognition, again, that the people who write the plans, who write the business strategy, are the least likely to see it through an independent, uh, critical set of eyes. And the one example that I, I, I got to find some evidence about in the book that people didn't know about is uh, alternative analysis is really good when people are highly certain about outcomes. And uh, in 2001, May 2001, the United States uh, uh, found some evidence that they believed Osama bin Laden was in this high-walled compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan. They never had uh, conclusive evidence that he was there, but a ton of circumstantial evidence. And so once you have a ton of circumstantial evidence, you try to bring in every technology you can to find him, but eventually you have to make an assessment. Is he there or not? Now, if you've ever seen the movie Zero Dark Thirty, the woman who plays the character Maya is a real person. She's a, she worked in, in the counterterrorism center for a long time in the CIA. She told her bosses, who then conveyed this to other people in, in the CIA and then in the Situation Room of the White House, she really believed that it was 100% certainty that, that bin Laden was there. And her colleagues were all at that degree of certainty. And the reason was they were really good at finding and killing bad guys. These were the people who were targeteers for drone strikes. These were the people who were amazing at finding people who wanted to be hidden and finding them and killing them. And so they said, without a doubt, bin Laden's there. Um, but then they, then they decided, well, you don't, the people who try to, you know, the, the, you don't ask operational people for their assessment because they're too wedded to the product. They have a bias to uh, have the operation happen. So I was able to find a, this evidence of a red team that was concocted at the last minute where they found three analysts, two CIA, one from the National Counterterrorism Center, who knew nothing about this. They were given all of the uh, intelligence, all the raw data, and they, they were given five days to come up with their own estimate. And it had to be a probability estimate. So you had to put a numerical number next to it. And, and they came back, and the, the first person, uh, they, had, uh, they used this time, the first person said, <clears throat> I think it's a 75% likelihood that Bin Laden's there. And the second person said 60%. The third person, who was a senior CIA analyst who had spent the most time trying to find Bin Laden, said it's 40% tops. And it really goes to show the variability of when you bring people who are not operationally involved, how they come to different, uh, 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 they, they have a different take on things. This is all eventually briefed specifically to uh, President Obama. And President Obama famously says it was a coin flip. It was a 50-50 decision to, to go ahead and do it. But the point of alternative analysis is that um, it, uh, everyone feels more comfortable with the decision that's been made because the biases are less likely to emerge. They've been scrubbed out. Everyone has been able to uh, speak their voice, and they've been given protection from doing this. So the people who came up with lower estimates were not retaliated against. The people who came up with a higher estimate not retaliated against. It's sort of a safe space to speak, uh, to speak your mind. So the last thing I'll say is I have found in five, six years and then beyond, because I will tell you if you don't know this, once you write a book, you learn everything you didn't know. Because, especially a book about a subject like this, because then people come up to you after the fact and they want to share their own story. So I've learned more since the book came out. But I found a couple things that work best for red teams, and I'll just give three of them uh, before I stop. The first one is I always say, the boss must buy in, which is that if a boss does not care for a red team to be used for their institution, nothing else matters. The boss must signal that it matters. They must uh, invest manpower and some dollars into it. And they must give the red team total access to the organization that's being reviewed and assessed and challenged. Because if the boss doesn't give that access, uh, the organization will just stiff arm them because this is a slight hindrance to our jobs and we're gonna just wait till you go away and nothing will happen. And then finally the boss must be willing to say, we need to listen to what this team has to say because it might be useful to us. Um, and I have lots more in the book which, which I'm happy to talk about. Second thing is, a red team must know why it's there, right? Uh, you have to be scoped in a way that's useful to the institution. Um, the worst thing you can do in, the, in military parlance is what's called, uh, you don't wanna be the seagull. Because the seagull is the person after someone's written a campaign plan to invade a country, the seagull comes in and craps on it at the last minute and flies away. <laughs> that's not helpful. 
And, and as a result, a good red team starts very early and often working with the planning team on specific issues, but then stepping away. Because uh, uh, if you are too immersed, if the red team is too immersed with the planning team, they become institutionally captured. They start cheering them on. They want them to succeed. That's not helpful. But if you're too distant and you don't know the organization, what, it's, uh, what it wants to do, what its money is, uh, how much money they have to spend, it's, it's, it's sort of unhelpful. So it has to be scoped correctly. And uh, the, you know, that first step of red teaming, it's really an act of therapy. Because you would think that senior leaders know what problems they should worry about. They don't. Uh, and I have found a lot of people, I give these talks, and afterwards the CEO of an NGO or a private, or a private business or a military commander says, we want, we, want to, we want to red team our organization. And I say, OK, why? And they, and they don't have an answer. Like, they don't even know what they should care about most. And I, always, I have a series of, like, a survey and a series of questions I ask, especially to private sector people. I'll say, so what do you care about most in your organization? I'll say, well, quarterly profits is pretty important. And I say, OK, quarterly profits. So you care more about that than reputation? Because I could get access to the board and the C-suite's personal information and dox it and put it on the internet. And you'd be, pretty, you'd be all embarrassed and maybe out of jobs because it would look really bad. And they say, no, 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 that would be really bad. So, and I go, so, OK, so now we've established a series of priorities. Uh, and then I say, do you care more about market share or profits? And they go, well, actually, we have a series of products we're going to roll out, so I care about market share more. And they go, OK, now we've established some hierarchy. And now we can think about what it is you need help with. But most senior leaders don't even know what they need help with, which I found everywhere. It's, it's quite fascinating. The final point is, final sort of best practice, and I have more in the book, but is uh, you have to be willing to hear bad news and listen to it. Um, we, it is very hard and painful. Red teaming can be very painful to an organization because somebody has made a judgment about the people you work with. Um, and it's very hard. Uh, you can do internal red teaming. You can have people working for you and you can try to red team. But it's, it's very unlikely that the people you work with every day, you are going to suddenly see things differently. You, it just won't happen. You know? and, and in the military, there's an acronym called BOGSAT which means bunch of guys sitting around table. And, <laughs> and it's almost all guys. And, and it really is like, we need to bog sat this. And bog satting is the equivalent of riding a stationary bicycle. Uh, or in the private sector, it's also, we're going to do an offsite. We're going to go to an offsite, and we're going to have so many whiteboards and so much coffee, and we're going to really brainstorm and think hard. The truth of the matter is it doesn't work, because you don't escape uh, the people you work with, you don't escape those pathologies. You need somebody who can facilitate brainstorming, essentially. And the, the, the term for it is called liberating structures. And if you're interested, you can find these, lots of these online. Um, the US Army puts out something called the Applied Critical Thinking Handbook. You can Google it. They have over 70 liberating structures. And uh, you can use them in your own life, and your own businesses. But in the absence of that, like, you do not suddenly see things differently. And we're also very hesitant to hear bad news. So if you're not willing to hear bad news about yourself, about your organization, about what you need to do to improve, it's highly unlikely that you should ever hire a red team to do anything. Um, uh, because they are going to find things that are both process-based, how you are structured, how you're organized, um, how you connect with each other, and then they're going to find issues from sort of outside adversarial perspectives. Um, and I'll just end with this. I, I recently learned about there's a very uh, prominent uh, a consulting firm that does red teaming, which I hadn't heard about before, is basically <clears throat> they charge $250,000 every quarter, and, and um, they look at how people are taken over, how corporate takeovers happen, and they model a corporate takeover of your business. And basically the way corporate takeovers happen is not that, um, uh, it's basically the, it's, it's the impression that the board and the, the C-suite is incompetent. They don't have a plan. Their spendthrifts, their sort of embarrassing personal lives. And they find the most embarrassing, humiliating information they can about you. They find ways to make you look stupid and incompetent. And they say, if, this is how you're going to be taken over. Because this is what my team could find about you with a, a two weeks of essentially investigative journalism. Snooping around your garbage, doing sort of dark web searches open public databases. This is how we can make you look really bad. And this is how you're going to be taken over. And as a result of it, they learn to clean up their profiles. They learn to uh, correct these impressions. 
They have a PR strategy if they, if they do try to get hit, hit that way. Um, but it's essentially a red team because it's a group that's trying to find the worst thing that could happen to your company, which is a corporate takeover where you all lose your jobs. Um, and in the absence of hiring that, uh, it's more likely you're going to be taken over. And I always say, you can never prove that a red team is successful, but you can never uh, you know, uh, demonstrate that any assessment, uh, any analysis, any management tool was absolutely effective. It's impossible to prove. Uh, but I always say in the absence of doing a faithful, realistic red team, you're going to most likely make, make your organization, your institution, uh, more likely to a range of threats and scenarios that you cannot think about on your own. So with that, I think I'll stop. <clears throat> We have, we have time for some questions now. If you have a question, please r raise your hand. Uh, wait, I will call on you. Wait for the microphone, please. And make sure that your question is a question and not a comment. So we have a question in the back, second row. Uh, you've been <clears throat> pretty dismissive about uh, companies and their, their internal uh, ability to grow and understand themselves even. What about young, hip tech companies? Aren't they much better than you describe? Uh, young, hip tech companies don't even care. They really don't. Nobody in Silicon Valley has a competitive intelligence team. There's, they, if you ask people, like, who are your strategists? They're just, what do you mean? I wrote a business plan and I have some VC. Now I need to go execute the business plan. Like, that's literally, they don't have the depth, they don't have the time horizon to do that necessarily. But I have spent a lot of time with established companies and I look at their strategists and their competitive intelligence people, uh, and again, they, uh, you know, sense making in organizations is really hard. And one of the worst things a senior leader can be is to believe that they're omniscient. And a lot of senior leaders believe this. They believe if there's something going on in the organization they need to know about, they'll know. Either they'll sense it or somebody will tell them. If there's, if there's bad news, I will be told. And I will be told far enough in advance that I can do something about it. It's a really dangerous thing to, to believe, um, uh, but a lot of them do. So I, I will say in the tech world as well, like, yes, they collect uh, different types of data and information, but they have no better processes for how to deal with it than anybody else. And the truth of the matter is that, again, they, don't, they just don't do strategy, most of them. We have another one, second row, please. I love the concept of a red team in a corporate environment. But what's the risk that that red team, by virtue of highlighting the risks involved, creates paralysis around decision making? That all of a sudden the red team says, oh my gosh, there's this risk, that there's that risk, and there's so much focus on corporate consensus that because of the red team, nothing actually gets done. It's funny because I thought you were going to say the, the, the bigger risk I hear from the private sector is I don't want to be red team because I don't want to know about my problems because then I'm neglig negligent if something goes wrong. I, and, and so that's, that's actually the biggest barrier is I don't want to hire a red team to find vulnerabilities in my computer networks because then there's a document, documented evidence that something happened. And if there's a data breach, now I've, I can be hit for like triple, triple penalties. Um, that, that can be a problem, but if, 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 there, if the problem is paralysis, Again, a good red team doesn't, as I said, seagull, come in at the last minute. A good red team should understand the time frame with, within which a decision has to be made. Um, uh, and a good, the other problem is um, you have to know how to use the red team, which is the biggest problem that I sort of document in the book in the military is the military, and the, especially the Army and the Marine Corps, are trying to grow all these red teams. And they hire people how to do it. They train them. They become what's called additional skill identifier. You get a little badge. You're a red teamer. But they don't tell the, the commanders in the field what to do with them. So they literally show up and they say, I'm your red team. And you ha now have some colonel who's in a, a staff section who says, who are you and why are you here? And this is, ha this is happening over and over again in a lot of different commands. They don't know what to do with them. So again, part of it is that initial therapy scoping session, which is, why are you here? What is the time frame? How much money can you commit to this? What is the personnel maneuverability you have? The other thing a good red team does is it, it's, it, you know, it, it has a readout report. If it's uh, cyber um, penetration testing, they say these are the worst vulnerabilities that you've, we've uncovered, and it costs this much to fix them, and you needed this on this time frame. Here's the second worst, here's the third worst. So it's prioritized, um, and it's not saying you need to spend 
$2 million on intrusion detection software that you probably can't afford anyway, and it, it, intrusion detection software really doesn't work either for good hackers. Um, so like, they won't give suggestions that are useless. They shouldn't. Um, but again, you know, given the velocity of information and the difficulty of making that final decision, uh, all the red team really does is, is what they call decision support red teaming. They should be there to support the decision. But ultimately, right, the senior leader, the commander, the CEO has to make that decision on his or her own. Um, but the red team provides a perspective and an independent set of eyes that on, within, without it, that decision maker does not have. We have one question here in the first, first row, please. Based on your experience, uh, if you were asked after today to establish a red team for Hillary and Trump, how would you work out those two teams? So it's, not, it's actually not a um, theoretical question. I've, been, I've, 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 received, uh, I've spoken to people who run, uh, not run the campaigns, but are in the foreign policy aspect of the campaigns, and they, uh, more than one campaign on both parties, and they have, they have said, like, how could we red team what we're doing? Uh, because what, and, and, the red, and basically what I tell them is, uh, you need to be ready with rapid response to things that you haven't thought through. So what happens, um, you know, again, wh what would happen if Pakistan tested a nuclear weapon? What would be your response? Right? Pakistan hasn't tested since 01, I think. Um, you know, what would you do? What, what, I mean, because you need to have a message that is consistent with your nuclear non-proliferation strategy. And they have these big, well, Trump doesn't, but Clinton has these <laughs> huge teams. Clinton has like 16 or 18 foreign policy teams that consist of like 10 to 12 people apiece for every region, every theme. And I said, you need to ask these people to do some uh, scenarios, some what ifs uh, um, to, that you haven't thought of. The other thing, useful red team, as I said, is you need to team B, right? Team A is the people that run your staff, that make things done, your plans, your policies, your strategies. Team B is, comes in apart and just tears it apart. And they say, uh, and I sort of said like, what are the likely attacks that you will receive from your opposing candidates? That's another thing I've sort of said. And you have to be realistic. So it's, it's more than just a murder board, right? A murder board tries to poke hole in a speech or in a presentation or some port. But a red team, as I always say, is different from all these things because a red team is, by, if nothing else, it's incredibly exploitative. Good red teamers are amoral people. They do not care about your feelings or doing things wrong, right? They want, to, they want to make it as painfully for you as possible so it will compel some degree of change. Um, one of my favorite quotes in the book is the Dan Irwin, who is the uh, a risk, a C, a CEO risk of a risk company. He said, you know, the surest way to get senior leadership to care about a disaster management plan is to burn down the building across the street. But you rarely have a spare building to burn down, right? So you need to uh, create in their minds a sort of tremendously worrisome catastrophic scenario that will make them more likely if it happens and even take preventative steps to make sure it doesn't happen. We have one question in the back, please. Please, please wait for the microphone, sir. <laughs> What's the best way to pay a red team? I say after they, they, they give their final report, but <laughs> it depends on what you need, right? It depends on what you need done. So you can hire, if, for example, if you, if you have a small company, you want to, you care about your computer networks, you can hire pe people for ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. They'll spend two days, try to break in every way they can. They will find vulnerabilities you didn't know about. Like, for example, if you can send PDF files to a copier, uh, to make copies of them, uh, they can probably get into your computer network through the copy machine back the other way. Uh, they, can, they will do some spear phishing attacks to see if your employees, because basically, um, uh, and there's, there are all these great surveys, like basically a third of everyone will click up anything that has 401k information if it looks viable. And then younger people will click things if it says uh, pics of the party last weekend. Like they will just click links, which immediately download malware. So you can do really basic testing like that up to, you can spend a million dollars for a three month open-ended penetration test of your entire corporation uh, to find vulnerabilities in every, in every consistent way. Um, so it depends on how much money you have. Because the truth of the matter is uh, companies like Fortune 10 companies have red teams all the time trying to cause havoc to them. Uh, companies, uh, when they don't have a lot of money and they're not have, having good returns, red teaming is really easy to cut 
because it's never a core business practice. It's a nice to have, but it's not a must have. Um, so it often gets eliminated when, when business goes south. Ironically, it's often when a business is flat on its back and is at its sort of last legs that a red team can have the most, have the biggest impact. Um, if you want to read a really great book about this, there's a great book called Billion Dollar Lessons. And in Billion Dollar Lessons, they, they looked at every way Fortune 500 companies fail, right? And it turns out Fortune 500 companies, they don't fail because of market timing or implementation. Like, nobody's dumb. They're actually really smart people. Fortune 5 companies fail is because they have the wrong strategy. Uh, and everybody who has the wrong strategy, they all thought it was the right one. They all, write, they all wrote it, they all implemented it because they thought it was the right thing to do, and they were all wrong, right? So uh, when a company is near bankruptcy, when it is really struggling in market share, that's when it can be really, really impactful. Um, so it depends on what you need and what you can sort of afford to do. Yeah, all the way in the back, please. <laughs> Hi, Micah. Thanks for presenting today. Um, I just have a question, really just curious. So where do these red teams come from? I mean, are, they, are there a lot of companies that are specialized in this? I mean, because you said that you want to prevent against the institutional um, mentality, right? So just where do they come from? So uh, it, the, the red teaming is an invention of the Cold War. The red means the Soviet Red Army. It was an invention of um, the Pentagon under Robert McNamara and the RAND Corporation. And this was basically trying to think about all the different ways that uh, the Soviets would cause trouble to NATO and the United States. And that's where the red comes from. Um, subsequently, it has always had this military and intelligence feel to it. That's who does it the most. <clears throat> um, the, the, the group that I really got the most unique access to and the most fun was what's in the CIA, they have something called the red cell. The red cell consists of 12 to 14 people. They operate completely independently from what are called mainline authoritative analytical units. They get to write whatever they want, basically. They don't have to coordinate it with other parts of the intelligence community. Uh, they, don't have, they don't need their senior leaders to sign off on every product so it gets sanded down, sanded down and neutered to nothing. They get to write really weird, out-of-the-box things. And the, and the products look different. They have turned... Uh, uh, um, some of their reports into uh, uh, comic books, for example, to get more eyeballs on them. And, and George W. Bush and Barack Obama have read every single Red Cell product that's ever been made. And the reason they read them is because they're different, right? Um, policymakers always say, reading intelligence is like reading The Economist. <laughs> it's like a really obvious take of what's happening in the world. But that's not what they want, right? They want something that makes them think differently. They want a wrinkle in what they see every day. And that's what something like the Red Cell does. So that's like a one example. Um, uh, there's lots of private companies that provide, again, go to any security conference, <clears throat> you hire the people, they break into your building, they break into your computer network, that, that's where they are. There, there are a lot of them in the military. Uh, uh, the Army and the Marine Corps, the most of them, uh, it's primarily still an American thing, although NATO, I document NATO has it, Israel has a really uh, incredible red team capability. The, it's, it's in Hebrew, it means Ipshat Masbra, which means the opposite is true, and it's, so, and it's a small unit in the, um, in the military intelligence arm of the IDF. Their only job is to demonstrate that what somebody is saying is wrong. And they do this from Netanyahu down to colonels at, the, at regional commands. Um, the best red team I ever found is actually in uh, the United Kingdom. Um, and I was very lucky to go to Swindon, which is about an hour west of London, and to meet with them. And they are in the, essentially the training and doctrine element of the uh, UK Ministry of Defense. And it's run by a retired one star and uh, named Brigadier General Tom Longland. And he has people, nobody wears uniform. Uh, no, there's no rank. Uh, everyone is very independent and horizontal. They have the right to say no to anybody. So if somebody comes to them and says, we want, you want you to red team, including 10 Downing Street, they'll say, no, we're not going to do it. If they think they're just doing a check the box exercise, they will not do it. Um, they've had everything from 22-year-old American interns to uh, what I always call the terminal colonel. The terminal colonel is somebody who uh, um, is old enough and doesn't care anymore. And that 22-year intern is young enough and doesn't know any better. Right, so that sort of balance and composition is really good, and they just do amazing, amazing work, um, in large part because of how it's led, um, and and just the mindset that they have. They're just they're. It's really hard to it's really hard to find people who think outside of the box. It is because that's not how you become successful. Trust me, uh, it is much more easier to do what is required to get along and get promoted at every step of the way, 
And people who think outside of the box don't stick in institutions uh, because uh, it, they're made uncomfortable there uh, by definition. So you have to find people who are willing to do this or you have to train them. And there are a lot of people who can't become red teamers because they try. I've been to Leavenworth seven times. Um, they have these people, they come in, they take 16 week courses. They can never become red teamers. They can never think differently. Like, uh, I mean, for example, they have people like, how are the different ways the Taliban can kill US soldiers on an Afghan military base? And there are a lot of US soldiers who don't want to think about that, right? They don't want to think about how to kill other US soldiers. And those are people who can't red team and you shouldn't hire them. So um, they exist in a lot of different places. The last thing I'd say, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, just Google red team journal. Uh, there's, a, there's, a guy, there's a guy named Mark Metesky, a brilliant, brilliant thinker, uh, who is basically the compiler and um, sort of connector of all the different red teams that are out there that we know about. Um, so just look there as well. Second row. Thank you. I'm trying to figure out how to make this a question. I'm hoping you can analyze it. With, end it with an interrogative <laughs> A little raise of voice at the end. There was an event uh, about a dozen years ago, and I don't know the name of it, where there was a simulation of war, sea war, in the Gulf uh, against Iran, and we lost. They brought in a, uh, a Marine, retired Marine general, for a second go at it, and we lost again. I'm wondering if you're familiar with this, if you can tell us how this worked out. Um, I believe the Marine Corps General went back into retirement without much being said about it. I'm just wondering if you could analyze and discuss that situation. I have great news for you. There's about 15 pages in the book that document Millennium Challenge 2002. Um, I know Lieutenant General Van Riper quite well. He was the retired Marine General who served on the Red Team who, it wasn't Iran, it was a, a Persian Gulf country of no name. Um, and if you don't know what happened, basically in the summer of 2002, there was a, it was the most expensive and elaborate war game ever in the United States history. It included live fire exercises off the coast of North Carolina, uh, off the coast of San Diego, and the simulations that was going on in Norfolk, Virginia at uh, Joint Forces Command. And uh, basically, it's pretty accurate as you tell it. The, uh, um, uh, Lieutenant General Van Riper, who was a really devious, different thinking guy, he had a small red team that uh, um, when the Persian Gulf, uh, when the U.S. fleet steams into the Persian Gulf, they were making a series of demands on the state. Basically, they told this, this, the leader of this state, you have to like, leave office or disarm your, your weapons of mass destruction. And they said no. And so before the U.S. Navy fleet could do anything, he sent out a swarm of small boats and uh, packed with suicide explosives and low, hot trajectory cruise missiles, and they sunk the entire US Navy fleet in about five minutes. And it was faithfully done. Like, he didn't cheat. He, he did exactly what he was allowed to do. And what happened was, and this is what, this is what does happen in military simulation exercises, is they, the control, the person who was running the war game, refloated the fleet, <laughs> and they continued the exercise. Because they had, it was gonna take 10 days, and they had to. Um, later on, what happens is they place a series of incredibly artificial constraints on him. Uh, among other things, they say, you cannot attack. Uh, among other things else, this country, this fictional country, they had the capabilities this country had in 2002, whereas the U.S. military got to have the capabilities that it believed it would have in 2009. So they had all these leap ahead future technologies that, by the way, the Pentagon never built and never tested and fielded. Um, but they said, like, you cannot destroy these V-22s, which are the very basically fast-moving vertical takeoff uh, um, troop transports. You cannot attack them when they're parked. Uh, you cannot use weapons of mass destruction. And then eventually Van Riper, like five days into it, he just says, well, I quit. This is artificial. This is a fake exercise. And then he goes to a journalist and tells them. Actually, first Van Riper sent an email to all his colleagues, and then he, this journalist found out about it, and then it was the New York Times. And I mean, you just really have to read the book because I found out, and nobody knew this until later the fact, I made a FOIA request for an after action report of what happened. It's 720 pages, you can now find it online. And it's really devastating. It's really devastating to read because the, the, the concepts that the military thought it was built basing its transformation on, and they thought 
would use, they could use for the campaign plan to take down Saddam Hussein, they believed had been validated because of an artificially constructed red team exercise. Um, and it's, a, it's semi, sort of painful to read, so take a look at the book. Yeah. Third row here, please. Did you come across any instances or organizational types perhaps where a well-executed red team exercise maybe had a negative impact or even was just somewhat ineffective to the ultimate objective? Yeah, I mean, there's, there, there's lots of instances of fratricide, as it's called, in red teaming. Um, there are a lot of uh, um, cyber penetration tests of computer networks where you introduce a really um, uh, advanced piece of malware and you shut down the entire network. You don't just find a vulnerability, you cause real harm to that corporation. Um, but the truth of the matter is most, um, most penetration tests like this are quite artificial in many ways because uh, this doesn't happen a lot. And the way I, the way I always, this is explained to me is, a good, again, somebody who wants to cause harm to your company, they don't care. They're gonna get in any way they can so uh, think of it as this, like this is the attack surface that somebody who wants to harm you has. But you hire a red team and you say, well, you can't come in during business hours. So now the attack surface shrinks like this. And they say, well, you can't come in through our third party vendors because we can't validate their own computer network. So now it, attack, now it shrinks like this. And then eventually they say, well, you can only come in through these IP, IP addresses because this is what we really care about. So now this is what the red team is doing. It's an artificial red team. And by the way, they still break in. Um, and if you know anything about the target hack, for example, the target hack was through the HVAC company that controlled the energy levels at target stores. They didn't get into target's networks. Target's networks were really secure. They got in through the company that was monitoring energy levels. Um, uh, so the truth of the matter is like that sort of fratricide doesn't happen that often because it can't. There are also many instances of um, simulations, like for example, before the bin Laden raid, uh, in um, southwest Arizona, the Navy SEALs set up a mock compound and they attack it many times and they do the full, not just attack the compound, but all of the helicopters, all the different ways. And there are instances where they do simulations like that where people actually get shot because they're doing live fire exercises. Um, so it can, that can happen uh, if you have a, a sort of incompetent red team. Okay, we have one question in the back. You've talked about um, uh, the military and uh, corporations, and you've mentioned NGOs, but uh, what about the big uh, government uh, agencies like uh, Medicare, Department of Labor, IRS, and all of those places? Yeah. Um, so ironically, one of, also one of the more painful stories in the book is before the um, Obamacare website rollout, they hired McKinsey to do an assessment of all the different ways it could fail. <clears throat> and basically, and the House Republicans doing a review of it got access to this. You can find the, the McKinsey report online. And basically, exactly what happened with the Obamacare rollout was warned to the White House months and months in advance, and the White House did nothing about it. Um, so they do, some of this does happen from time to time, uh, too infrequently, I would say, though. Uh, because again, if you know anything about since 2010 sequestration, it's basically impossible to hire people in government. And uh, it's, it's especially impossible to hire people to do things like this. So if you're in the military, the intelligence money sloshes around and you can find the billets to do this sort of thing. But outside of that, like, there's just nothing going on uh, to a large extent. Okay, there's no more questions. Please join me in thank you, Mr. Zenko. And he will sign the books in the back.